All right, well then what happened to this hydrogen? Who's this hydrogen attached to? To the uh, tert-butyl, is that what that is? Yeah, that is tert-butyl oxide. That's good, but we always want to be specific about exactly what atom we're attached oxygen. to. Yeah, so we're attached to the oxygen. How do we know? Because the arrow tells us so. The key lesson is the arrows tell us exactly which bonds to break and exactly which bonds to form. As we talked about at the very beginning today, the common mistake students make is they just try to draw a picture that feels good or a picture that looks like what they've seen before, but those are both incorrect techniques. We need to draw the picture atom by atom that the arrows tell us to draw. The arrows tell us exactly what to draw with no ambiguity. Uh, we don't have any choices. Once you put in the arrows, you've got to follow the arrows. Okay. Uh, this is exactly what you came up with. So the only thing to improve on is just uh, being more confident in that. And that comes with just re relying on the arrows. Okay. And also, actually, again, notice how I went through this one atom at a time, carefully asking who exactly is each atom attached to. Um, because as the class goes on, you're going to get more and more complicated products. And students get worse and worse at drawing those complicated products. But actually, all of them should be equally easy. They should all be equally easy if you just go one atom at a time and do what the arrows tell you. It doesn't matter how complicated the product is. If you go one atom at a time and you've numbered the atoms, the arrows should tell you exactly what the product is, no matter how horrendously complicated it seems. But that's when um, just drawing what feels good becomes a less and less reliable technique. All right. Okay. All right, but you did come up with the right products here, so that's good. And nature is now happy. There's no charges left, so we should just call it a day. This is the final product. There's nothing more to do. Remember we said an elimination reaction is a reaction that forms a pi bond. And that's what we did here, we formed this pi bond. Okay. That's the end of our reaction. All right, and uh, you already were seeing it would be E2. The only thing that was giving you trouble was the mechanism here. So now we've seen uh, that mechanism. Um, by the way, remember that we need to memorize that elimination is something that forms a pi bond. Now that seems kind of paradoxical because you, want, you would think that elimination would be eliminating a pi bond, not forming a pi bond. Why do they call elimination forming a pi bond? Who was eliminated? Well, the things that were eliminated were the hydrogen and the iodine. <coughs> so elimination is something that forms a pi bond by eliminating two other groups. That's why it's called elimination. By eliminating something from the beta carbon and something from the alpha carbon, we're able to form the pi bond. OK. Uh, all right, so that gives us that. So to review, um, we saw this was an O minus, and that could be either in a bulky or a non-bulky base. And we need to recognize that this is very bulky. And in fact, this is so common, you should know the name for it. And you told me correctly, the name for this is tert butyl oxide. Tert butyl oxide. That's a very logical name. Why is it called oxide? Because it's got a negative oxygen. Why is it called butyl? Well, butyl means four carbons. And you can see now there's four carbons. Now that I put in the carbon, I forgot at the beginning. There's four carbons. It's called tert because this carbon is tertiary. OK. Um, so this is tert butyl oxide, and it's definitely a uh, bulky base. Um, and there's really just one other bulky base that is used a lot in OCHEM, which is called LDA. Uh, it's worth knowing what the structure of LDA is, but I guess we won't spend time on that today. We'll just hit the most important things. But we should have memorized LDA is a strong bulky base. Those are the two common bulky bases in the okay. OCHEM. So if you look at the rightmost column on that table on page three, I think those are already listed. Yeah. yeah. So here we got LDA and tert-butyl oxide as the strong bulky bases. And you can see those almost always give you E2 because they've got so much steric hindrance. Okay. okay. So those should kind of, kind of be memorized. Let's try uh, drawing the mechanism here.
Now, um, so let's uh, review what we've done here so far. Uh, let's see. How do you know this is going to be an E2? Because um, of the bulky base and it's on a second. Uh, yeah, degree. secondary row and a strong bulky base, that's an E2. This is almost always an E2. Okay, and then you were going through uh, the mechanism. So one good thing you did is you identified the beta carbons. Uh, and notice how originally um, you had a misstep and you thought that the oxygen would be attacking the alpha carbon, but then you caught yourself. But you can see that's a very easy confusion to come into. Why would people do that? Because if this was an SN2, the nucleophile would attack the alpha carbon. So we need to see the distinction there. A nucleophile does attack the alpha carbon. But a base steals a proton from the beta carbon. So it's good that you caught that. Now you also notice that there's two beta carbons here. Um, so I think that you were trying to draw two different mechanisms for the two different attacks. That's a good instinct. However, notice that these two are basically symmetrical to each other. We're going to get the same product either way. Uh, actually, it might be a good exercise to prove that to yourself by drawing it, but to save time, we're going to get the same product if we attack either beta carbon here, because it's a symmetrical molecule. So we'll save time and only draw one product. Organic means. Organic means carbon containing. So this is a product, but it's not an organic product. Now, do you see this is the um, so this is organic because it's got carbons, and this is organic because it's got carbons. This has no carbon, so it's non-organic. Now, as the course goes on, actually, usually we're mainly interested in the organic products. So a lot of the time you'll see in answer keys, they might only draw the organic products. But it's certainly never wrong to draw the inorganic product, and sometimes it's useful. So at the very beginning, it's useful to draw every single product, unless you have a test question that specifically says organic product products only. All right, so you actually might see some answer keys that might leave this out. But for a beginner, it's good to include this. OK, uh, so you did great, and I messed up. Uh, so you got the exact right products here, but it looks like I have a very hard time drawing chert butyl oxide. Um, because what, I, what did I leave out here? Well, I left out this little three. Remember, the whole reason that's giving us all the, the hindrance here is that there's supposed to be three methyl groups. Otherwise, this isn't really tertiary. That's where the chert butyl comes in. So we should fix that in your notes in these two places. So both times I've tried drawing chert butyl oxide. I messed up both times. So you, you shouldn't leave out this carbon. You shouldn't leave out this three. So there's two threes here. OK. Um, all right, so now we have the right formula for chert butyl oxide. Um, and now we have this right product over here. OK. All right, well, I was saying how complicated this mechanism was, but it looks like we're making progress on that. Except, again, remember, it's easy to fall into the trap of having the base attack the alpha carbon. No, it takes the hydrogen from here. By the way, what would have happened if we had attacked this beta car uh, carbon? We didn't go through the whole mechanism, but it's not too hard to see that the product from attacking this beta carbon would have been this. But if you just take this and rotate it, you'll get this. So these would be the same thing. All right. Um, what would happen if you would get different products from these? Well, that's a little bit of a more advanced topic that you probably won't go over until a little later in the course. We won't go over that today. Right. You actually you might eventually see problems where you have to choose between different beta carbons. Um, but you might not be going over that at this point in the course. We won't get into that today. I'm only going to give you problems today where there's only one beta carbon or the beta carbons are equivalent. That's a good uh, for our, our beginning approach.